Recording in progress. Matty Ice, how we doing? How we doing? Good, man. How about you? You know, the uh, the jet lag hit me a little harder than I would have expected, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's. I was pretty, uh, I was pretty tired coming back. How about you? <laughs> I slept for like the whole day and like Casey yeah. called me and he's like, what are you up to? I'm like, dude, I'm napping. And he's like... <laughs> You're just living the life. Go to Maui and then just come home and nap all day. I'm like, bro, I'm so tired. It was it was surprising. Uh, I, it was my first time in, in Maui, and it was surprising how much it hit me on the way home. It wasn't bad there, but on the way home, who I've I've done like the East Coast swings, you know. So like you're uh, traveling from Pacific to East Coast. Those are challenging in their own right, but. The, uh, the return trip from Maui really hit on a different level for some reason. I'm glad I'm not the only one that gets wrecked by that because Eric was like, dude, you're over-exaggerating. I'm like, I don't think so, man. This like, it just wrecks me for two or three days before and afterwards. Like, yeah, yeah, it was, it was something else. Uh, guys, welcome back to another edition of the Hush Life podcast. I am joined. This is BMAC. I'm joined with uh, one of our creative cameraman extraordinaires, Matthew Lee, otherwise known as Matty Ice. And we are, uh, we're just going to, we're going to catch up. We're going to recap uh, a little bit of our trip to Hawaii. Matt has an argument that I'm interested in hearing that uh, mule deer are a superior species compared to chasing elk. And um, just maybe talk about some of the the plans the plans that we might have kind of upcoming everybody's deployed and doing different stuff. So, um, Eric's currently on like a fishing trip. Casey's on a family trip. Uh, Logan just wrapped up a really incredible, uh, bear hunt episode that went yesterday called more than just a hunt, which if, uh, if you guys are listening and or watching on YouTube, I would implore you guys to go watch this video called more than just a hunt. And uh, Casey and Logan were invited by some uh, good friends of ours at Stone Mountain Outfitters. Ben Rogers and his wife own that company. They are uh, close friends with the folks at Weatherby. We've known Ben for a lot of years. Uh, He's become a great friend over those years. And he was able to donate a spring bear hunt to one of his good friends, Scott. Scott and his his wife, unfortunately, experienced a tragic loss of one of their um, one of their kids. And this hunt was a way uh, to try to help Scott through the grieving process. And so uh, Scott wanted to share his story in hopes that maybe it could help somebody else going through some of the struggles and the challenges that he has experienced. Uh, So please give it a watch. It will touch your heart. It will pull at your emotions. And Logan did a really fantastic job of putting the story together. So that is on our YouTube channel more than just a hunt happened to land on father's day, which also kind of struck a different, a a different nerve. I just really can't imagine what Scott and his family had to go through. Um, but certainly grateful that he was comfortable and open to, to share a story. So that's kind of the, the most recent video, uh, like Maddie and I were saying, we were, we're jet lagged the flight from Maui, uh, back to salt Lake, we did uh, we did the red eye, which man, I feel like I'm getting too old for red eye flights. <laughs> yeah, I uh, it wrecks me at 23, 24 years old. I can't imagine being much older and just <laughs> you're nuts. Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know why we even picked that one. I think it's the only one we had. But we left Maui at 8:30 p.m. and uh, it's a four hour time difference from Maui to the mountain time zone. And so we didn't get into Salt Lake until 9.30 in the morning the next day. Had a brief layover in Seattle. Um, but it was a successful trip by, by all accounts. My first time ever experiencing the Hawaiian Islands. And man, we didn't see a beach, but it, at least not a sandy beach. So that was a little bit funny because my wife was giving me grief. She's like, you're going to Hawaii and you're not taking me? Are you kidding me? Um, but it wasn't really that type of a, a trip. We were up country. Not the term, Matt. Yep. Up country. You're a local now, dude. 
basically local. Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. Local now. Uh, we were visiting a good friend of ours, Nick and his family. They, uh, they've been residents of Maui his whole life, uh, multi-generational family. And uh, Nick was sharing some of the stuff that's uh, passionate to him. If you guys have followed along long enough, Matt and Eric have been there a couple of times. Eric's been there several times. Uh, this is my very first trip though. And Hawaii has some interesting um, hunting opportunities that I think maybe get overlooked, but nonetheless worthy of consideration. What, uh, Maddie, in your opinion, like I mean, you've, you've explained it to me, but tell the people like what your thoughts are on hunting Hawaii as a whole, spe- specifically Maui. Goodness. Uh, it's literally probably the greatest place to hunt on planet earth. And I, I mean, I haven't been everywhere, but I've been quite a few places in the U S so I can't speak for like other countries, New Zealand, Australia, I know have a lot of opportunity, but if if you're just wanting to get like reps in reps, glassing animals up reps, stalking with rifle or bow, uh, like following through a shot process with a rifle or bow, like that. I don't think there's another place that I know of that you can get that many reps in such a short amount of time. So if, if you're looking to like really sharpen your hunting skills, I I don't know of a place that you could be more proficient at it than Maui. I don't. It's uh, it's an interesting landscape. If you've ever visited Maui, you probably um, have most likely gone down to like the, the beaches, right? Like that's what it's, a little piece of paradise, certainly known for the tourism. Um, and by doing so, maybe when you're traveling there, you, you looked kind of all around you and seeing like the vast landscape that kind of creeps out of the Pacific ocean and just works its way up to 10,000 feet of elevation. And in those landscapes, um, is where we were spending most of our time and we were hunting axis deer which are native species to India, but uh, you can find them in Texas and you can find them in parts of Hawaii. They are a really interesting invasive species, technically, but an incredible game animal to chase. They have like a different level of twitch in them that I think make even a whitetail seem docile. So they're very turned on, they're very spooky. Um, but what we've kind of found over the years too, there's some of the absolute best game you'll ever eat. Just my favorite, my wife's favorite, uh, haven't eaten all, all this different species out there, but had a, had a number of them and certainly access to your rank very high on that list. So they're, they're great in that regard. There is a lot of them in Hawaii and, uh, and Texas. They are able to reproduce at a, a, an accelerated rate compared to like a mule deer or an elk. In Hawaii, they don't have any natural predators and obviously mild winters to say the least. So it's a pretty idealistic landscape for them to uh, explode their population. And by doing so, it seems to just be growing at a really accelerated rate year over year. Uh, which has this interesting dynamic dichotomy to it. It's a double-edged sword, depending on where you stand. From a hunting standpoint, like Matt said, talk about a target-rich environment, um, a place where you just need a hunting license, and then obviously you need access to hunt them. But at that point, it's pretty wide open. There's not a a bag limit. Um, You could hunt them year-round. And so there's abundance of opportunity to hone your skills on axis deer in, um, in another term though, if you're maybe a rancher, a landowner, they have a tendency to do quite a bit of damage on the landscape. They are exceptional at grazing, say they'd outgraze local cattle and, you know, horses and such. And by doing so we'll, uh, take down the natural grasses and what have you to dirt basically, um, particularly in certain areas where they're maybe isolated to various pastures or, you know, pockets that are surrounded by some 
you know, more urbanized areas, they'll just eat the grass down to the bare dirt. And then what happens is the non-native species and grasses will start to emerge and kind of has this tailspin of changing the dynamics of the landscape uh, through invasive weeds, if you will, kind of taking over where the native grasses were. So there's some interesting components to hunting those critters. And then in addition to the axis deer, they also have um, a good amount of wild pigs on Maui. They have uh, quite a number of wild Spanish goats in some different areas. And I do believe there's even some sheep on certain parts of the island. Uh, we didn't hunt any of those. So our target species were axis deer, pigs, and the goats. And I guess the only way to describe it is like visually when you see some of these hillsides, it really looks like cockroaches scurrying yeah. across the landscape or picture like the African Serengeti during like the migration of like a plains game species where they're just, your mind is blown by the amount of game out there. So that kind of like describes, I guess, like what we would be seeing. Um, I was blown away just by the sheer abundance of these animals, like literally everywhere we looked uh, on the, on the places we had access to hunt, but also on places just driving around town. Like they're just everywhere. Yeah. I mean, if you were there, let's say during some sort of apocalypse or food shortage, you'd be just fine. The chickens, the pigs, the wild, even beef cows. I mean, you'd be living like a King out there. <laughs> yeah. I, so news to me, but there's a ton of wild chickens running around and in certain parts of the island, there are wild cows that are just out on the landscape. They're meaner than hell. Um, and just big, gnarly wild cows running around. So it, it's just very, very different. Um, it was really cool to, to have like a more localized experience where you're not necessarily a tourist, but you're like, you're with some people that born and raised there and, and, you know, just see it in a different way. I've always enjoyed that as I've traveled around is trying to like take in a little bit more of the local flair versus maybe your traditional touristic spots. So that was super cool. Um, but our goal was to capture some great content to uh, certainly fill up our Yetis with meat on the way home. We we're able to do that. And then just have like a lot of opportunity uh, we talked a little bit about this on the video that will be coming out a little bit later on the summer, but any people I've ever met that are residents of Hawaii, uh, a lot of folks in Texas, New Zealand, Australia, and frankly, even some of the Midwestern Eastern States where you can shoot a lot of different white tailed deer does, what have you just like, you know, upwards of five to 10 a year those folks have a tendency to be exceptionally proficient in hunting. And um, a buddy of ours, EJ, uh, who owns BSR down in Texas, was uh, is known for saying like the, the best way to get good at killing stuff is to kill stuff. Uh, and so like, imagine living in a place where you could hunt year round, 365 days a year. There's no bag limit. I mean, opportunities to hone your craft galore. And uh, that's super interesting because so many of us that have grown up like out West, you know, we might on a good year have one or two tags in our pocket. Maybe it's a mule deer tag, maybe it's an elk tag, maybe you get lucky and have three tags. But on most occasions, you're kind of looking at like very limited amount of opportunity to draw your bow back on a live animal and release an arrow or even maybe take a shot with a rifle. And I think there's a huge advantage of these folks that live in some of these places where opportunity is more abundant to really get good in the moment. And uh, that's kind of like what my objective was for the trip was uh, trying just to get more reps in the moment because over the years through our experience and, you know, Matt, you've guided a ton of people and, probably drawn down on more animals or been a part of more animals than most, but 
there's that moment of truth where you have to execute the shot and there's various conditions and situations, whether you're archery hunting or rifle hunting, um, you know, you've got your emotions, you might have uh, your heart elevated because of terrain topography, and you got to like get the shot executed on a live animal and things seem to change when you put your peep on a live animal and you settle your pin on a live animal or your reticle and crosshairs move, you know, onto an actual mule deer or an elk or a pronghorn that energy, the, you know, buck fever is something different. It is. I mean, it's kind of like, so growing up, same kind of thing. Like your buddy EJ said, like I was a big time wrestler and you can practice seven days a week, hours, hours a day. And you're never going to have those experiences. We call it mat time. So if you go to tournaments every weekend and just get as much mat time as you can, all your matches, exhibitions on top of that, there's nothing like practice, like the real thing. And you hear that a lot out West when people are trying to get in shape and exercise and the best type of exercise to get in shape ready for hunting season is just to put a backpack on and go hike around the mountains. So I, I think it correlates perfectly that uh, you really don't know how you're going to perform or react in high stress situations until you've put yourself through quite a few high stress situations with being able to make minimal movements, minimal sound. I mean, it's one thing to be in a high stress situation and be able to kind of just hurry and react. But a lot of times with these animals, especially axis deer, you have to hurry and react, but you have to be absolutely silent and hardly any movement. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like the best of both worlds where if you can get into position on an axis deer quickly and efficiently, I feel like mule deer and elk is just going to be a piece of cake D depending on terrain. Terrain is a lot sure. different, but I mean, as far as if it was level playing fields on terrain, I mean, like, like Nick, our buddy out there, he's killed. I don't even know how many axis deer, but if you put that kid out here with his rifle and some of this mule deer habitat, let's say sagebrush and like quakies, I feel like he could do a lot of damage really quick. And, uh, and it's just because he's had countless opportunities to pull up his rifle, like line up on the animal and take a shot. So, I mean, you can't replicate that anywhere else. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's pretty apparent, you know, I think mistakes that we've made over the years, um, are just because of what you mentioned, like a lack of mat time yep. and we haven't committed to like hunting as much whitetail country. So, you know, a lot of times we might have one or two elk pot tags, maybe a couple, maybe a mule deer tag here, or there. And we're certainly w very fortunate, you know, compared to what I was able to do before hush, when I had a full-time job, it was one or two hunts a year. That was it. And you can go to all the 3D shoots in the world. Um, Total Archie Challenge, certainly helpful, no doubt about it. But it just changes when there's an actual living animal at as the target. And particularly if there's one that's got you pretty excited. And how do you handle that? I think there's variables that, that you can kind of like help prepare yourself, uh, having like good fundamentals and a, a shot process. I think it's valuable, right? Where, you know, like you've, you've dry fired a lot preparing for the process of getting set up, whether it's a rifle or a bow, don't not dry firing a bow, obviously, but dry firing like a rifle and just preparation for, you know, that moment of truth and getting comfortable with the fundamentals of a smooth trigger pull, your setup, no doubt. I think there's similar ways where, uh, archery hunting, you can really kind of get concentrate on the fundamentals of like a proper shot with the release, making sure you're not stopping the trigger. You're again, you're breathing, you've got the fundamentals, but a lot of times people lose, lose it once the adrenaline kicks in and the buck fever kicks in. And how do you stay calm and, you know, execute the shot on that opportunity? Cause sometimes that might be the only opportunity you have for the year. And I think the, uh, the ability to like practice 
in an environment like a Hawaii or a Texas where you're going to see and probably have more opportunities to shoot is sure helpful. Uh, it's also kind of a lot of times those uh, hunts happen like off season. So you're not sacrificing like your typical mule deer, elk, antelope stuff, but you're actually substituting time that you would otherwise maybe not be doing any hunting, uh, whether that's like the summer months or maybe even like some of the winter months, uh, finding these additional opportunities is pretty cool. So that was my whole intention going into it. Certainly experience new country, new culture, um, new terrain that have never hunted before. Like the, the, the train is just super beautiful in Hawaii from, you know, the ocean floor all the way up into some of the big old eucalyptus forests, the koa trees, like there's just some neat stuff mixed in with a lot of different, um, you know, like stuff that looks like paradise, big giant gulches that have like kind of water flow through them to, uh, tropical looking plants and shrub and you name it. Very, very scenic and beautiful. And that's what these critters are calling home. Uh, but certainly for me, it was like preparation for fall. How many opportunities with my bow could I get spotting and stalking just to try to like improve upon a craft that maybe I haven't had a chance to do as much of the last few years. Um, how many opportunities just, you know, sitting behind the rifle scope and trying to get comfortable and situated and making sure your parallax is set, your bubbles level, executing a good shot. And uh, I'd say by all accounts, like we were able to check a few of those boxes and some of the most beautiful train you'll ever set your eyes on. Yeah, it was super cool sitting back on two stocks that are super in particular, uh, you stocking up on these deer. And just seeing like, I couldn't see what you were seeing, but I could see, I could, I was putting myself in your shoes, right? Like you start like crawling on your hands and knees. Then you must've seen antler tips. You start belly crawling and then you make it to the shrub, like your target shrub. And then all of a sudden I see you like come up, kind of range a couple times, like maybe come to full draw in one direction and then i see you let down i'm like oh what's going on and then all of a sudden i see an animal come up out of another direction you hit another range you dial your sight it was just so cool because it's like when you think of like real world scenarios when it comes to archery hunting i was just watching it unfold 30 yards ahead of me with you just like going through the motions but i mean my heart rate was elevated. I can't imagine you just like <laughs> yeah. when you're sitting back watching a friend and you're just seeing them like do everything. You're like, Oh dude, he's just doing everything the right way. Like he starts army crawling, you know, he's keeping a shrub. He's staying behind a shrub to break up the skyline and everything. And it's just like, dang dude, that's textbook. You know, it's just so cool. And you're, you're just, you're getting your reps in. And I feel like come fall, you're going to be able to reflect on some of those scenarios and be able just to be a lot more prepared. I mean, how many animals did you shoot with your bow three or four? And it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I it, it mean, you know, just even be able to draw back on a live animal practice that stuff. And here's the cool thing with Hawaii. If you screw it up, you're not far from another opportunity. So there's <laughs> not like, it's not like if you're hunting like a big high country basin for mule deer, if you screw it up, like you're probably done for a good amount of time because trying to get over to maybe where you bumped them or maybe you bumped them out of the basin altogether um, could really be like, uh, you know, means for a bad day. But in yeah. Hawaii, where we were at, you're just like, well, if I just hike over to that next little, you know, gulch or whatever, chances are I'll, I'll be able to like turn something up not too far off. So like, what are you going to lose if you, if you mess up and that's really happened. Certain mess ups happen for sure, but it was just, uh, it was awesome to, to get an opportunity to really practice some of that stuff that you just don't get that much practice on, um, on a typical year. And with us, you know, a lot of times we're, we're trading tags. So one year, you know, I might have a couple tags and another year I might have one tag and it just kind of depends on how things shake out. Um, whether I'm helping out or the hunter myself, it, it's really varied over the years. I'm with you though, man. I get as excited, if not probably more excited when 
Casey or Eric or you or Logan, someone has a tag or, you know, born and raised guys. Like I almost think it's harder to be sitting back watching than in the moment. Uh, Cause I just, I want obviously my friends to be successful. I want things to go smoothly. And a lot of times they do, but you know, sometimes they, they don't. And, you know, trying to like pick your buddy back up after something went sideways is always, you know, important as well. But uh, over the years, I've enjoyed both components of holding the tag and then just being along on the hunt. I think you can, you know, bring a lot of satisfaction out of both of those. But the, uh, I would say my first time in Maui was overwhelmingly uh, amazing. Uh, certainly looking forward to trying to go back again at some point in time and looking for more opportunities that might fit in the calendar and the budget to just go get more reps. Uh, I really, I'm a believer of that I think reflecting on things I've struggled with over the years is in the moment, probably rushing too much and making sure I just like slow down. And I, here's an example that I see happen a lot is particularly like elk hunting in the moment of truth when especially you're like we're calling in or something uh, and you got a cow call and get them stopped. I think a lot of people, certainly I have a tendency to rush through the process with the idea that even though I just stopped the bull and he's broadside or whatnot, he's probably going to boogie out of there pretty quick. And I think usually if you were to sit back or you're the friend watching, you're like, man, that elk had no idea we were there. He was totally broadside. He's trying to put it together. Like what just happened? Like, I don't see a cow, but I heard the noise more than likely like five to 10 seconds. He's easily going to be there completely broadside. But in my internal clock, it's like 1001, you know, I better shoot it. And by doing so, I think I've, I've rushed shots, um, that, you know, weren't like the most perfect hit. Thankfully I've been able to recover some certainly probably screwed up and lost a few over the years of my career, but trying to just slow down on the moment, execute a great shot and, you know, watch the animal fall down is like the dream for an archer within your, in your site. Um, and thankfully in Hawaii, I had a chance to do a couple of those, which was really, really just what I took away as like, man, that's, that's what I was hoping to get out of this. Didn't care about like how big they were in the least. I just wanted the repetitions of spot and stalking, executing the shot, you know, and recovering the animal. So that was a, that was a big takeaway. I'm excited to see how the thing comes together. Matt's working on edit now. Um, I would imagine it'll be out some point in time, like middle of July, end of, end of July. And hopefully, uh, you guys will enjoy kind of the footage that we put together. And if you ever have a chance to, to go chase access deer, whether it's in Texas or Hawaii really couldn't, you know, couldn't recommend it enough. It's just, they're fun. Whether you're sitting in a ground blind on a water hole in Texas, or you're spotting and stalking the, the lush Hawaiian landscaped. Uh, I think you will get a ton of enjoyment out of it and no doubt about it. Like just amazing meat quality. I I concur. I had backstrap and eggs this morning. Access. I saw backstrap. that. And I mean, Dude, we made it, we made it last night. It was so good. I can't think of very many wild game that let alone I could have for breakfast and not even need any like sauces or condiments. And it's just like, yeah every bite was just like dang <laughs> and it's so good for you like not yeah. only was it delicious and felt good eating it but i was just like my body is gonna this is rocket fuel rocket fuel i like that yeah it's it dude it's my wife is like can you go like do that more yeah. you know like that is so delicious i will take a full freezer of that stuff yeah um which i'm like okay we can do that like if you say so, <laughs> I'll say say no more. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. So that was a super fun trip. Uh, it's been a great summer. We, um, we have a, a hunt giveaway going on currently. If you guys are following along, we are giving away a pretty incredible mule deer hunt experience. So one lucky person is going to join our team on a mule deer hunt with our friends at RK hunting company. They're based here in, uh, in Utah, not too far from Salt Lake city, may hour and a half away, maybe. And they have arguably some of the best mule deer hunting land 
in the state. Uh, Matt used to guide there for several years before he came to work for us at Hush. And, you know, over the years, we've done some of these giveaways. Some of them require no purchase at all. And some of them you get entered by buying stuff off our website. And essentially like $1 spent equals one automatic entry. So as an example, if you picked up a hat, it's 30 bucks, you would get 30 automatic entries. And we hire a third party company that manages it. They select the winner randomly. Uh, from the entries that are compiled. And then we get a hold of the winner and take them on a hunt or give them away my, my truck and a jumping jack trailer. We did a really sweet New Mexico elk hunt last year uh, that uh, Adam won from New York that was fantastic. And so this hunt's going to take place in October. It's going to be at RNK in Salt Lake. The, uh, the hunt's valued at like over $20,000 in total which includes like the, uh, the ability to hunt on the RNK property, your tag, your license, your food, your lodging, your transportation into Salt Lake city. We're going to pick you up and we are going to go spend some time, uh, trying to find you a, a buck to get you excited. Nobody in our group is going to have a tag. We're just going to be there to help and glass and hopefully pack some meat out, but it is a special, special place. And Matt, I know with the amount of time that you've spent there, it probably helped turn your uh, love and passion for mule deer up even that much stronger. So Matt's the type of guy, and there may be some of you listening or watching that is all about mule deer. And we we put up a, uh, like a poll or something on social recently. It's like, what what is it? Are you a mule deer person? Or are you an elk person? And it's funny, the, the debates between folks that are like really tried and true passionate mule deer and those that are all about elk. And some people are like, Oh, elk are just big, dumb animals or super vocal. Anybody can kill them. Like a mature muley is just on another level. Um, you've got to be like a better hunter to, to kill a big buck. And then you've got other people who are like, Oh, mule deer are just so lame. They just sit there like no fun. There's no vocalization, like not exciting at all. So it's quite the debate. <laughs> Matt, explain your, your your reasoning of why mule deer are superior. I'm so curious. Okay, so how do I want to start my argument? Okay, so I would say, <laughs> as you were talking earlier about your experiences, possibly rushing some shots on, let's say, an elk when you're calling an elk in. I've had so many opportunities to call in elk and have clients shoot elk i've shot elk and it's just like there's just as long as you have the wind in your face you can basically do anything and i i've had clients empty a full quiver on elk on public land as well i mean when granted it is during the rut they are compromised just like a mule deer is a little compromised during their rut but you shoot and miss and the thing kind of takes a few steps. You cow call or bugle and he turns right back around. And I mean, I would just have to say, if you're looking straight at some of the best killers and hunters in the game, top two that come to mind are like Randy Ulmer and like um, uh, Jason Carter. Okay. Those are like top two for me. And although, I would say a 400 inch elk is far more rare than a 200 inch mule deer. I agree. I 100% okay. agree. But if you look at, let's just say those two killers, I would say like a mature mule deer would be in that seven to nine year old range. That's where they usually hit their peak. And I would say elk are usually around that eight to 10 year mark. If I, if I had to take a, educated guess and if you were to go ask randy ulmer or jason carter what animal is more difficult to kill whether it's a mature mule deer or mature elk regardless of antler size let's just say they're mature age i would have to say a hundred percent of the time they're going to say a mule deer and to me that is something i can personally personally explain as I've guided 
I don't know. Let's just say I've got it a hundred hunts. I've had a hundred clients and let's just for this argument, 50 of them have been elk, 50 have been deer. And the amount of mature elk I have killed and not like blown stocks on or ruined an opportunity is far greater than the amount of mule deer that we have been just busted by. And the terrain is the exact same terrain. That's the cool part about RNK. We're going to be hunting some huge mule deer and we're going to see a lot of elk. And that just, has, like you said, has strengthened my love for mule deer just because I don't know. If you see a big elk bedded down facing away from you, I feel like you can just walk right at the dang thing, get within bow range, and you don't have to worry about it really jumping the string. Their lungs are the size of a beach ball. I mean, <laughs> versus a mule deer bedded facing away from you. I, I mean, most of the killers, they'll tell you, you don't want to get within 60 yards. It's kind of a bubble. Like you better be proficient with your bow. Cause if, if you want to press your luck and try and get within 60 yards, you're really just walking on eggshells at that point. And you're just asking for a disaster. And the amount of mule deer I've seen just with a sixth sense outweighs elk, mature elk 10 times. Like it's just, it's not even on the same playing field in my opinion. So that's, that's where my argument is. I mean, it's a, it's a good argument. <laughs> it really is. I guess you got to break it down. Um, you know, when, when people think about what is a superior species, like what, what is it about it that excites them when they're hunting them? So yes. on the, on the mule, mule deer argument side, you brought up a lot of great points, right? The, um, just how switched on they are with that sixth sense. The, the fact that if you're holding a bow, there's certainly going to be some challenges trying to stalk in side of 60 yards and, and get one shot, especially if they're bedded down. Um, on the elk side, you know, I think what turns on a lot of people is just the vocalization of it during the rut is something that is pretty hard to beat. Yeah, you I'm gotta, not gonna. You gotta have. A, I'm not gonna you know, you argue. Have a point there. I'm not gonna argue that elk are less fun than mule deer. Yeah, because rutting elk is probably the most excited my heart ever like really gets. But just something about like when I think of a big mule deer, I just think of like a monarch. Just like that's the pinnacle. There's nothing greater in the united states just a big mule deer and another point i didn't even think about was elk well other than like let's say idaho or maybe montana elk aren't really getting hunted by many things in colorado wyoming utah like i mean there's wolves in montana and idaho but like mule deer are getting slammed by mountain lions and to be able to survive eight to 10 years in such dense mountain lion habitat, it's like those animals just have to be so much more intelligent and just wired. I don't know. It's just like, in my mind, it's like a green beret or something to like just a base level Marine. They're both, they're both hardcore. They're both awesome, but there's just something added it's just like sure you can't, you can't really argue too much i i think it's just yeah you, people again <laughs> your points are valid i think i think you you've made a good case i guess it comes down to personal preference you know like a, like a lot of things in life as a hunter you know what what gets you more excited more interested in the pursuit is it you know that strategy and patience that comes along with chasing mule deer or is it the vocalization and like the run and gun of chasing elk, particularly during the rut? Um, I think both are exceptionally fun and, and enjoyable and they present different challenges at different times and different situations. But I would agree with you. Like some of the guys that I would consider some of the absolute best hunters that maybe you don't even 
know of, frankly, um, are pretty big mule deer guys. Yeah. <laughs> Not all of them, but man, a lot of them. There's a lot of guys out there that may not be very well known in like the quote unquote, you know, social media world that are just exceptional hunters. And it seems to me like their uh, main kind of thriving passion is chasing mule deer. Oftentimes with archery tackle, like the high country, which is even more difficult, or they're just so incredibly keyed in on mule deer. Like they're setting like an age class and um, an antler size. That's just kind of next level. You know, like if you got guys that are turning down, let's call it like a 180 to 190 class buck. That's just another level of patience that most people are never going to touch in their life because a 180 mule deer is, is an exceptional mule deer. Yeah. I, Not only from typically an age standpoint, but just an antler configuration size standpoint. Very impressive. And I know a lot of people that are not even going to bat an eye at those type of deer. Cause they're trying to, you know, eclipse that like 200 plus category. Um, which again, just can be like another typically layer of maturity on a deer, certainly more challenging. And I guess the thing I respect the most about a lot of these folks, um, I've got the names of a few guys, but I'll just keep that to myself, but their patience is is really unmatched. And some examples would be people who are keyed in on one particular deer. That's it. One deer. They're hunting one deer in a season and they will oftentimes watch that deer for days on end. I'm talking like seven to 10 days on end where the conditions aren't correct. The, but the buck's not bedded in the right spot. The wind conditions are a little wonky, whatever the case may be. And I think where a lot of more impatient hunters would just be like, hell with it. I'm going in for it. Like, wish me luck. Yeah. These guys are just so calculated. They're just not going to make any move unless they're, you know, 80% sure they can kill the deer, maybe higher, but the level of patience to sit on a hillside in August with your bow in your hand, chasing velvet mule deer. When the days are long, I mean, they are so long and they are hot. And these, these guys are willing to sit on a glassing peak for the entire day. When it's so, I mean, dude, it, there's a lot of downtime in those moments. I'm talking a lot. And you may only have that window in the morning or that window at last light to get something done, depending again on the place and the situation. But the patience that these guys will um, showcase is super impressive. And most of the time, they'll end up getting that one individual singular buck they chased. Not always, but a lot of the times they're walking away. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard day seven, day eight, day 10, day 11. Holy cow. That's a lot of patience. Yeah. It takes a different kind of guy to do that. Yeah. I mean, one of my mentors and relatives is probably like one of the best. And I, I spent countless hours hunting with him and glassing with him amount of patience that guy has i mean he's drawn elk tags and it's literally like a bull in a china shop like you let a killer like that loose with animals that live in thick timber that provides so many opportunities to navigate and get close let alone they're bugling i mean it's just it's not even fair some of those guys <laughs> just like are so so lethal but devil devil's advocate here elk are five times better tasting than a mule deer in my opinion mule deer are delicious and prepared correctly i mean it's a party pleaser for sure but you can't argue that mule deer is better than elk that's that's a losing yeah, battle i, I would mean, agree i mean the best tasting mule deer i think i've ever eaten is when casey killed his high country buck in the summer uh in august that that was fantastic but certainly 
some of the deer that we've killed, you know, in the, um, November timeframe, not nearly as appetizing to the palate. elk crushes mule deer 10 out of 10 times, uh, on the table fair side of the world. And man, maybe on the fun side, I mean, dude, strategy and patience is, is a cool part of the pursuit. But for a lot of people, and I think I might be in this category, just being under a hundred yards of a bull that's screaming its face off and you have a bow in your hand is about the most fun you can have out in the woods. It gets so enjoyable. Even if you don't fire an arrow off, having that interaction on, uh, you know, and trying to call them in and, you know, all those variables, pretty dang enjoyable. I'm not going to argue with you. Like if I were to take, let's say somebody who's willing to try hunting for the first time, I'm taking them elk hunting over mule deer hunting. If I have the yeah. choice, it's like, sure. if I want to show this person the best time possible, we're going to go chase rutting elk. And uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like elk is more fun and definitely, definitely like something that people idolize and always look forward to. And it's always going to be a good time versus like mule deer. I would dare to say it's a lot more rewarding. It's in my, <laughs> this is going to maybe offend some people, but it's like checkers and chess, in my opinion, like elk, you got to play the win. You got to possibly know how to call a little bit, or you got to be smart enough just to keep your mouth shut. And that's about it. Being a good, being obviously a spot where there's elk, play the wind and play vocalization. I feel like those are the two moves you got, really. And then with mule deer, I mean, it's just so many moves. And you could argue, play the wind, like conceal yourself. But I, like you said, the planning and the stock, that's my favorite thing about hunting and mule deer hunting is sitting back talking about okay if i go up this fold in the ridge and i can get behind that, that log and belly crawl down or i crab crawl this direction maybe come parallel because i know those thermals could be switching at that time so i'm not going to risk going above or below i'm going to go straight sideways perpendicular like it's just it's just so sick <laughs> it's fun they're, they're both fun in different ways so we, uh, anyways, we decided to do a mule deer hunt for a lot of the reasons we kind of talked about, you know, like we did a rifle elk hunt last year, had an absolute riot. We, uh, were successful in getting Adam his his, uh, first bull in New Mexico his, his best bull, uh, to date saw a lot of elk, had a lot of opportunities. So we wanted to do something similar, but yet mix it up and make it a little bit different. Over the years, like mule deer have uh, found like a certain place in our heart. We uh, had a lot of great memories and time hunting in places like Colorado and Nevada, Utah, and certainly have this like deeper appreciation for, uh, for mule deer than maybe we did, you know, before we started the hush thing. But we thought like, why not do a mule deer hunt giveaway? And we generally try to partner with like, uh, friends that are in the outfitting kind of guiding community for a lot of reasons, but RMK was certainly one that came to mind. We had familiarity with them. Um, Matt having worked there for a lot of years, known Daniel and Travis for a long time, and they just put on a good operation. They're dialed. They have, uh, beautiful accommodations that are going to be great for us to, to bring someone towards, and then just like the country that we're going to be hunting is super, you know, just beautiful. It's um, got the potential, you know, to really have like a buck of a lifetime. It, you know, it's hunting. It's it's certainly hunting. We're going to do our dangness, but the quality potential for mule deer there is is really special. And for those reasons, we decided like let's let's do a mule deer hunt. So I'm really excited that, that again, the hunt's going to be in October. Uh, it could be anywhere from like cold snowy conditions to like warm conditions is very dependent on the weather. Um, it's going to be, you know, pre rut for the mule deer, 
but post velvet. So going to present some different challenges. Like in that sense, we'll be doing a ton of glassing. So covering a lot of country with our optics and to Matt's point, you know, if we find one that gets the winner excited, then that's when the strategy sessions begin. How do we get a game plan and, you know, get into a good shooting position and, and try to capitalize on the opportunity at hand. So it's uh it's going to be five days of a whole lot of good times. Hopefully we'll turn up a couple next level deer that really gets somebody excited and um, have some success there. So really thrilled about that. What do you think, Matt, was your, like, what's the most, I don't know, what's, what's your favorite thing about chasing mule deer out there? Gosh, my favorite thing would have to be the ranch in particular. So RNK has several ranches that are different units and tags. But the ranch we're hunting, I would have to say the diversity. It's a huge ranch, 260,000 acres, which is just huge. And uh, being able to hunt low sage, ponderosa, cedar type stuff into transitions into like some steep oak brush kind of pine. Then you get up to your quakey subalpine areas above tree line. That's probably my favorite part about hunting that area is the diversity in the landscape and just the sheer number of deer and the minimal pressure those deer experience. Like it may seem kind of daunting, like seeing all the pictures of deer being harvested through RNK or whatever, but like you have to, you have to realize that's like spread out over like 2 million acres. <laughs> like those deer are really special and the amount of deer and the terrain really allows you to find those unicorns or those one in a million type deer where i've been hunting the same canyon for let's say months you know like some of my favorite spots and just randomly one day huge harvey wall hanger comes walking down out of the trees and you you just can't you can't ever experience something like that. It just can't be replicated. The feeling you get when you in your binoculars or you see something with your naked eye, just your heart skips a beat. It immediately, immediately kicks in like your killer instinct, just like everything happening, like the culmination of it all. It's, it's the best thing. And to be able to have that in such a beautiful controlled environment where you know okay, some Joe Blow isn't going to walk over the ridge and ruin my whole stock. You're able to hunt the deer as efficiently and patiently as you want to. And that's, that's something that's so special. I mean, some of the biggest deer ever killed are on public property just due to the number of people out hunting public property. But I would have to say the most enjoyable deer hunts – I've ever been on are on private ranches like RNK. And it's just, it's just because you're able to really slow down, appreciate what is unfolding in front of you and just being able to take in everything. Like, like I said, there's no pressure, there's no competition. And if you don't have a good opportunity, you're like, well, we'll just come back tomorrow morning. Nobody else is going to go in there. Maybe a lion or a coyote or something, but I mean, it's just less stress. And to me, that's one downfall of public hunting, which I, I love. I primarily do that, but that's one downfall that sometimes you can't help, but get super stressed. You're like, is somebody else glassing this deer up right now? Like I saw a truck down at that trailhead. Maybe he's on the deer and it's just snowballs into emotions where here it's, you get to appreciate it. I would say that's my favorite part. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, out West growing up, um, nobody I knew had the ability, the access, the connections to hunt any kind of private country growing up in Oregon. Everything was just public was kind of like our, our chance to like find a little piece of heaven. And whereas like maybe growing up in the Midwest or East, certainly in Texas, Hawaii, like there's places where private land is really like your primary opportunity, but in the West, it's certainly more challenging to find access. Um, 
you know, the, the opportunity to, to get on a piece of private is harder. A lot of times like bigger pieces of country that might have good hunting are operated by a corporate ranch environment. Um, so it's not like you're kind of your mom and pop rancher that might have a few thousand acres that you can door knock to try to get a deer or an elk on. It's like a big corporation that's operating a, you know, a ranch that's a for-profit ranch. So things have changed in that sense. We have grinded on uh, the public land kind of boy general tags to maybe we get lucky and draw a tag for our entire lives. We love it. We thrive on it. It's uh, it's difficult. It's it's unique. But I would say we also are so supportive and open to people finding private land opportunities. I think if if it's legal and you have um, either put the effort forward to like make the connection, you maybe have a friend or a family member that has that. By all means, like who wouldn't want to take advantage of what Matt just described and like having a chance to chase deer or elk or whitetail, whatever it might be in um, a different capacity where you don't have to worry about maybe somebody else or competition or variables that are like out of your control. And so uh, we don't have that happen very often over the years. We've mostly hunted public. There's a few situations where I guess we have had done a few of them, but for like the hunt winner environment, we don't necessarily know who's going to win. They might be very novice. They could be very advanced. We have no idea. And so this, these kind of controlled environments uh, where it's going to be on private, like we're talking about with RNK is, uh, and it, I think that's an intriguing component of it because we can cater to a variety of skill levels, a variety of fitness levels and make a cool hunt happen no matter what. Uh, Adam Hunt last year was on public land, his New Mexico elk hunt, that was public. Um, and that was super cool, but they're all different. And I think, you know, sometimes the hunting community gets a little judgy on, oh, you're, you're doing this style of hunting or you doing that or whatever. Like, I mean, I don't know who cares, <laughs> like if it's legal and you're out doing it, like good for you. And I think, again, if you are presented an opportunity where you could actually gain access, whether you went and door knocked and earned it yourself, or if through a friend you figured it out or through a relative or whatever the case may be, or you paid a guide or an outfitter, like good on you, uh, enjoy your time out in the woods because not everybody has like the bandwidth or the capacity to go do it themselves on public land. They may not have the skill set. And I just think we got to support each other in doing what makes you happy. Right. And if we can do that and be supportive of all different types of legal hunting, we're going to be a stronger community of people um, compared to like some of the bickering and, you know, like, I don't know, judginess that I see sometimes happen. What a waste of energy, you know, every, every year from January to March, we've got all these new bills and legislation being introduced across the board. Doesn't matter what state, but these anti-hunting groups are targeting predator hunting. They're targeting trapping. They're targeting all these components, trying to chip away at the lifestyle that we all love so much. And why are we wasting our time complaining back and forth amongst each other as hunters? Like, let's get, let's get beyond that, right? Let's work towards the real people that are trying to threaten us, um, which is attacking a lot of these different variable portions of hunting, whether that's, you know, bear hunting or cat hunting, or kind of seem to be starting there predominantly. And then that works into other aspects um, of hunting, you know, that a lot of states are introducing these just terrible bills. And thankfully there's a lot of great organizations that are out fighting the cause for us, but man, we got to be better as a group. We got to work together. We got to support each other and understand like where the real threats are. And, you know, years ago, the most critique we would ever receive was always via anti hunters. That was it. And man, I swear the last few years, it's been more hunter generated criticism and critique. And dude, we're not perfect by any means, but man, we try to do a good job of just showing it how it happens. Sometimes we make mistakes. Um, sometimes we hunt private land. Sometimes we, we don't. It shouldn't matter. You know, it really shouldn't matter. And so um, 
anyways, I'm super excited about the opportunity that we're going to have later this fall. If you're interested in, in, you know, joining and trying to get your name in the hat, it doesn't matter if you buy a $5 decal, you're in the hat. And so you can uh, just jump on our website, gethushing.com, grab yourself a decal or a hat or something. Your name is in the hat. We will be um, wrapping up this promotion on the 6th of July at midnight mountain time. And we're going to pick a winner by, I want to say July 15th, we'll have a winner announced. And then the logistics and the planning will start. We'll identify like the week in October that we're going to be hunting, get the airfare bot, we're going to get you all the gear that uh, comes along with the mule deer tag. So you're going to get like a, a brand new Weatherby Hush Vanguard Edition rifle chambered in 300 Weatherby. You're going to get a Vortex Optics package. A cool package from Yeti, Mountain Ops, pair of Hanwag boots, a first light kit, a lifetime elite Onyx membership, uh, Exo Mountain pack. So pretty much everything you're going to need to go on this hunt, you should win with it. Uh, so it's like $7,500 in gear. And then, you know, the other is just like the lodging food and stuff. So yeah, 20,000 bucks is the prize package. And we just couldn't be more excited to figure out who this person's going to be. It's um, a few weeks away until we'll be kind of announcing the winner. So make sure you get your name in the hat because it's going to be here soon. We're going to be finding out who we are taking. It's fun, man. Uh, I can't thank everybody enough, whether you're listening or watching for the continued support over the years. Whether you listen to the podcast, you watch our videos, you follow us on social, maybe you've grabbed like a hat or a hoodie. Uh, maybe you've participated in these giveaways. We feel so incredibly fortunate to wake up every day and do something that we love, something that we're passionate about. And uh, we would not be able to experience this without the support of so many folks. So thank you guys um, for all the years of support. We are excited about what the fall is going to bring. Tags are kind of finalizing. Got some cool stuff coming up. I think I think there might be um, another Alaskan adventure in the mix. Gonna have some really sweet elk hunts this year. We got some awesome mule deer hunts. So far, things are kind of shaping shaping up, and definitely getting excited. Yeah, man, I'm uh, I'm excited to join you guys on your annual high country mule deer hunt this year, and um, I I know a couple of us don't have archery tags, but I hope yep. that we can all get together and spend a couple nights in a camp together and teamwork. And I think it would be, it's going to be an awesome summer. For sure. Yeah. So we're getting full force into man, shooting the bows, uh, getting trail cams prepared, ready and set for where it's, uh, it's legal. Some new rules in Utah this year, which is going to minimize a little bit of the time that you can let them soak. But nonetheless, uh, we're going to do as much scouting as we can and just try to come into the season prepared. I think uh, right now is prime time, too, for just like getting the old cardio and the legs starting to get going. If you haven't so far, like Matt said earlier, I think the best way to get ready for hunting is to go hike in the mountains with a backpack. Like personally, that that has always been uh not only the most enjoyable, but I think the most effective on just kind of getting dialed. So that's uh, some of the stuff we have uh, going on. We'll be doing uh, weekly vlogs on most every Monday. Going to try to do more podcasts. We've got some hunt story series that we we're going to try to kick off this summer, which should be really cool. Kind of a more in-depth look at some of the more, uh, I guess, viewed and well-known hunts we've done over the years on the Hush channel where, you know, a video certainly tells a great story visually, but a lot of times through time constraints and editing, you just can't quite get the detail that you could on a longer form podcast. So we're looking forward to kicking off some of these hunt stories, going in depth on some of the more well-known uh, elk hunts in particular that I think people will enjoy just like maybe learn, learn a little bit more about like the lead up to the hunt, some of the dynamics of during the hunt, even maybe the post hunt kind of response or uh, what have you. I think it all should be pretty cool. So we're going to work on trying to get those filmed and recorded. And yeah, man, summer is, is kind of officially here. 
Yeah, even though it snowed this morning. Where I live. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> it's here. It's been a weird year, man. Yeah, I have a some trail cams up and my buddy he has a cell cam right next to mine and he's sending me all these pictures of just like like this one right here just snow on the ground and there's oh, just yeah elk, wow elk with snow on the ground right right above my house and it's like goodness <laughs> i i love the moisture but dang i'm ready for it to warm up a little bit yeah i think i mean i hope it uh it helps with the fire season this year um, you know, New Mexico and Arizona are getting hammered with fires kind of early. Montana's dealing with crazy flooding from like the spring runoff. Uh, that's just absolutely wild. It's been snowing and raining a lot in Utah here where we are. And certainly for being, you know, the week of the 20th of June, it's, uh, it's a little, a little different, but hopefully the moisture translates into better antler growth and better fire prevention with any luck. Um, again, I know if you guys are living in New Mexico, down in Arizona, it's been a crappy fire year already. And man, hopefully the monsoons will start rolling in and, you know, getting you guys in a better position, but that is, uh, that's going to wrap up this episode. We, uh, we appreciate you guys listening. We'll have more to come kind of get the group back together. Once everybody kind of like reconvenes from their summer travel extravaganzas and uh, start going through these hunt stories. So I'm excited about that. Again, make sure you get your name in the hat for the giveaway and uh, we'll, we'll definitely join you guys on another episode. So we appreciate you following along and uh, let us know your vote, mule deer or elk. What's it going to be? You know my answer. Adios, guys. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>